you hold your Bibles up, and let's pray. Father, we come holding your word high and exalting it. We come this morning, Lord, to hear what you would have to say to us through your word. We pray, God, that you would, first and foremost, show us your Son. Show us our Savior in the Scriptures. Let us see and behold his glory. And secondly, Father, we ask that you would show us ourselves, that we would see our own unworthiness and our own sinfulness and our own vileness, that we might look to Christ and be saved. Father, encourage us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would join me back in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And for those of you who are wondering uh, why we sing a Christmas song this morning, uh, there's two reasons for that. Number one, it's been so hot outside, I thought it might be, thank you, make you think of a, of a cooler time. But also, uh, this morning we're going to talk about Jesus, God, becoming a man, taking on human flesh. And so I thought that song would be uh, fitting for the sermon this morning. Now the past few weeks we've been looking at how John introduces us to Jesus here in the Gospel of John. And he's shown us how Jesus is divine. And he has a special word for Jesus, the Word. It's a title that he gives to Jesus. And the reason for this, we said a couple weeks ago, was because Jesus was not his name until he took on human flesh, until he was born of the Virgin Mary. That was his name given at birth. Even though Jesus, the Son of God, existed in eternity past. But he was not known as Jesus in eternity past. That was not his name until he was born as a man. And so John doesn't want to use that name until after he explains to us that the Word, God, became a man. And he tells us this very clearly in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now this morning we're going to look at one verse. If you would stand with me while we read it. 1 John, or John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You can be seated. This is actually the verse that gave me the title for our, uh, our, our sermon series uh, that we're doing on John, Glory Revealed, because this is what John wants us to see and he tells us about Jesus. He wants us to see the glory that the apostles saw. Though we're not going to see it with our physical eye on this side of, of heaven, we must see it with the eye of faith. And it's no less true for people who even saw Jesus face to face when he was on earth. Right? They saw him, but many of them didn't realize who he was. And so they didn't see his glory. But to behold the glory of Christ, even when they were standing in front of him on earth, they had to have the eye of faith. And so we have to have the eye of faith in order to see the glory of Christ. This morning, we're going to talk about a really deep subject, a very deep doctrine, but it's a very important doctrine. Now, we have to grasp this, yet we can never fully understand this. This is a, a deep truth. This is on par with the, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, and how it's a mystery on how all these things work out and how it looks, but yet the Bible teaches it clearly. The doctrine that we're going to look at is the doctrine of the Incarnation. And that's a big fancy word that simply means that God takes on human flesh. In fact, you already know a lot about this doctrine. We have an entire holiday dedicated to it called Christmas, right? Where we celebrate the fact that God became a man. And so this morning is basically Christmas in July. But this one verse this morning that I want us to look at, we'll look at the rest of the passage in, in, in another week, but, but this morning I want us to see these, this great doctrine, the incarnation of Christ. And there's another thing that's attached to this doctrine that's another big word called the hypostatic union. All right, And that's going to be on the test. I'm just kidding. Um, that's just a fancy term that simply means the doctrine of Christ's two natures. So Jesus has a human nature, and a divine nature. In other words, Jesus is fully God and fully man, both at the same time. And so we're going to look at this, this truth this morning, and then I'm going to give you five points at the end um, that, that matter for us and why it's important. But let me start by giving you a statement, and then this is going to be the statement that's going to carry us through the most of this sermon, and this is the heading in your bulletin there. Jesus is fully God 
and fully man, united without mixture, change, separation, or division in one person forever. And that's a mouthful, I know. But we're going we're gonna to break that down. So, the first part, Jesus is fully God and fully man. John says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Such a simple sentence, yet it gives us probably the most profound thought that a human being can ever contemplate. The divine, the creator himself, stepping down into time and taking on human flesh. Now this isn't what like the uh, Greeks and the Romans used to teach about their gods. Uh, that's a claim that people have. They'll say that Christianity stole this idea of God becoming a man from the Greeks and the Romans and from the Egyptians because they have gods that have intercourse with women and then they have babies. And those babies are half God, half man. But that is not what the Bible teaches. First of all, the Bible teaches that God is not like us at all. God is not just some big, bigger, better version of us. God is spirit. And the Bible says that He fills heaven and earth. That there is no measurement to be had for His being. There is no form that we should behold Him. The God of the Bible, it says, dwells in unapproachable light. God in the Bible is so holy that to even gaze upon Him for a millisecond would disintegrate you. And yet this God takes on human flesh. Christ takes on human flesh. And that is not a result of some kind of sexual union between God and Mary. It was the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, who came upon her. In the same way that the Holy Spirit was upon the face of the waters in Genesis 1-2. Making in the womb of the Virgin Mary the very flesh of the Son of God. The Son who existed in eternity past. Only Jesus was not a demigod, a half man, half God. He is fully God, and yet fully man both at the same time. The Bible teaches that God took on human flesh... And in so doing, He did not diminish His divine nature. Nor did He add to His being a man. He was a man in the same way that we are. Now this is such an essential truth, we just read it a minute ago in 1 John 4, that John says that if you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, you actually are lost and don't even know God. This is such an important truth to our faith. That the Word was made flesh. That God the Word took on human flesh. And this is more than just God wearing a human suit. right? Jesus is not simply a man who was blessed with the divine Spirit. He is not simply a man who was filled with the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit, but that's not what made Him divine. Jesus was divine. He was the Christ before His baptism. It tells us that the angel announced to Mary, or to the, to the shepherds rather, that on this day is born in the city of David the Christ, the Savior. Right? And so He was born the Christ. He didn't become the Christ. He was born the Christ. God taking on human flesh means that He took on all of the essential elements that make us men. He was made like Adam. He grew up through the stages of infancy and boyhood into manhood. Maturing and growing, the Bible says, in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and man. This is all four of the developmental categories that we go through as we grow up, that we should raise our children up in. Wisdom is intellectual growth. Stature is physical growth. Favor with God is religious growth. And favor with man is social growth. And Jesus grew in all of those things. Jesus had all of the weaknesses and the inconveniences that belong to being man, except, of course, He had no sin nature. Jesus was like Adam in the beginning. Pure and uncorrupted in heart. Jesus breathed air, walked on the earth. He ate food. He was hungry and thirsty. He was tired and weary. He slept and dreamed. He was hot. He was cold. He actually became a man. God took on human flesh. And He didn't just take on the parts of man that He liked. He took on the weakest part of man. Jesus Himself said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus took on the weakness of of man. In fact, 2 Corinthians 13:4 tells us that Jesus was crucified in weakness of flesh. Flesh also refers to man's death and mortality. In Psalm 78, God remembers that men are but flesh and passing away. And Christ 
Peter says in 1 Peter 3.18, was put to death in the flesh. Flesh refers to the taint of sin that is in men. Though Christ Himself was sinless, the Bible says in Romans 8.3, He appeared in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sweated and was exposed to all of the elements of the fallen world. Suffering in life as we all do under the curse of this fallen creation. It's like when Adam sinned in the garden. God told him, From dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. And it was not just a curse for death, but it was a pointing out that man was earthly. That sin had cast man down into the the dust of the earth. And God, in order to redeem us, took on that flesh and lowered Himself down into the dust with us. Where the Bible says He actually became a curse. He became sin on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus Himself said, being quoted in Psalm 22, that He was a worm and no man. That He had been made even lower in the dust of the curse than all other men. Jesus became our weakness, our curse, our death. He took on human flesh in order to take our place. He came to where we are that He might bring us to where He is. I titled the sermon, He Dwelt Among Us. Because Jesus came, God came and He dwelt among us in order that He might redeem us, that we might dwell with Him for all eternity. What a wonderful mystery that God would take on human flesh. The humbling of Himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This also means, Christ taking on human flesh, that He exposed Himself to the temptation of the devil. Now we we face temptation and we stand against it. Christ's temptation was actually greater than we could imagine. Imagine yourself shut in a room for just one hour with the most vile person who ever lived. And that person's objective in that hour that he's with you is to undermine your principles, to pollute your mind and take, make you think blasphemous things, to wound your conscience, destroy your joy and peace. And there'll be mental and, and, and physical suffering. There'll be frustration and anger in your heart. There will be torture for your soul for that one hour. And yet Christ endured that in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, shut up with the devil. Never was the devil's attacks more fierce than when he had a chance to tempt the Lord of glory. Never was his fiery arrows more pointed and accurate and well-aimed. Never had he a chance like that to tempt the Lord of glory before. You know that he gave it everything he had. He brought his best tricks and deceptions, the most enticing of sins. And yet Jesus, by taking on human flesh, exposed himself to that temptation in order that he might overcome the devil and be the captain of our salvation. Christ withstood the temptation to the end. It was the greatest of strengths and power of the will in human history. Jesus endured temptation. And He endured it all the way to the end. I, I shared this quote a few weeks ago in, in Sunday school. And uh, I'm going to read it. It's, it's a little bit lengthy. It's, it's a paragraph. It's, it's about five sentences. But C.S. Lewis explains the temptation of Jesus in a way that I think is important for us to understand. This is what he says. No man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people don't know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of the wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would be like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because He was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is the only man who knows the fullness of what temptation means. So what C.S. Lewis is saying is essentially that because None of us have ever withstood all of temptation all the way to the end. We lay down and we don't know the strength of the wind when it pushes against us. 
We don't know what it's like to fight that temptation all the way to the end every single time. And yet Christ does. Jesus endured the temptation all the way to the end. And so he actually understands how difficult it is. How hard resisting the devil's lies are. Now I do want to clarify, there is a difference between our temptation and what Jesus faced. So we have three enemies in the world. Well, the world is one. The devil and the flesh. And the flesh there refers not to our weakness, but to our fallen nature. You see, we're oftentimes tempted and led into sin without the devil even having to lift a finger. Right? Our, our own evil hearts lead us away into sin. Jesus' temptation, though, was all external. There was no sin in the heart of Jesus to lead him astray. There was no, uh, a feel, there was no desire, no affinity for sin. There was no possibility of temptation from within in Jesus because his nature was not corrupt. Yet, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. In other words, Jesus was tempted in all of the same categories as we are, and yet he never sinned. He was tempted by the same temptations we face. Now, it doesn't matter if we're tempted by the devil, the flesh, or the world. All of those temptations still fall under the same three categories. There's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All sin falls in those three categories. And it doesn't matter if we're tempted by the devil, the flesh, or the world. Our temptation for those sins are still there. And so Jesus, though he was never tempted internally by his own evil nature, because he had no evil nature, was still tempted by the devil and the world in those three categories. And so the verse is true. The reason I bring that up is because that verse tells us that because Jesus was able to endure the same temptations as us, he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses and give us grace and help in our time of need. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But this is also important because this is what makes Jesus our great and wonderful high priest, that he understands and he gets us. But in Jesus' temptation, the devil didn't have a foothold in the heart of Christ because he had no internal sin nature. He was not twisted in his desires. You see, Jesus was born of a virgin. It was Jesus who had no earthly father. If Joseph had been Jesus' biological father, he would have had a sin nature like the rest of us. But Jesus was born without a human father and was therefore had no sin nature. And this is important because if Jesus had sinned, or if Jesus had a sin nature, then his death on the cross could not pay for our sin because he would only be paying for his own sin. So why does it matter that Jesus became a man? Why make a big deal about this? To the point that even John says, if you deny this, then you don't know God. Well, because if Jesus didn't become a man, he couldn't have been tempted. If Jesus didn't have a human nature, then he couldn't have faced temptation because James says that God is not tempted by sin. This means Jesus could not have been our high priest. He could not be our example. Jesus is the example that we're to follow. He's the standard. We're in the process of sanctification to become more like Christ. If Jesus had not become a man, he could not have died for our sin. Which leads us to the second part of the, the, the phrase I gave you at the beginning. Jesus is fully God and fully man united without mixture, change, separation, or division in one person forever. John says, we beheld the glory, His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now, this is the difficult part to grasp. God, there are certain attributes that are only God's. Certain characteristics that belong only to God. And then there are certain characteristics that are only for men. And yet the Bible teaches that Jesus possesses both at the same time. And this is a very difficult thing to wrap our minds around. Jesus has two natures. The divine nature and the human nature. They both exist in Christ at the same time. Yet there will never be a time when these two natures exist apart from one another. When Jesus stepped down into time, He took on Himself a human nature. And he will always have that human nature. Those two natures exist at the same time in the same person. One day, 
when you see Jesus face to face, you will not be able to distinguish between the divine nature and the human nature because it's one person. Yet he has two natures. Jesus has a human body. He has a human mind and emotions. When Christ became a man, there was in some sense the hiding of his glory. It's like when your eyes, the Bible says is the glory of your soul, right? When you look into the eyes, there's a window into your soul. But if you close your eyes, your eyes are covered up by your eyelids. They're veiled. And in the same way, the glory of God, the glory of the Son, was covered in flesh and protected the people that looked at his face. Jesus limited himself in his human flesh to certain things of the divine nature. So there are certain things about God that Jesus limited in himself. So think about this. Jesus made himself frail and weak like our human flesh. He hungered and thirsted and was tired. And yet God is in need of nothing. God is all-powerful. Jesus, the Bible says, limited his knowledge to some degree to the point that Luke even says that he grew in wisdom. And yet God is all-knowing. But we should never think that Jesus ceased to be God. Right? A mystery is not a contradiction. There are instances, for example, where Christ seems to know more than any man can know. The Bible tells us He knew what was in the heart of certain men. He knew what they were thinking. But then there are other times when Jesus Himself says that He didn't know something. Right? He doesn't know the day nor the hour when the Son returns. Only the Father knows. So there's a, there's a level of where Christ has limited Himself. Before we move on, I want to clarify one thing. <clears throat> what we mean by Christ having two natures, the idea is not that He has two substances. Like, like there is some stuff that makes God God and some stuff that makes man man, and those two things have been smushed together in Jesus. Nature, a, a human nature, is like a complex of attributes. It's your personality, it's the things that make you you. And there are attributes that only belong to God, and there are some that only belong to man. But in Christ, they are together. They are combined to where He is fully God with all of the attributes in His divine nature, and He is fully man, just like us. To the point that we could even say that when Jesus was a baby in the arms of Mary, He was holding the universe together by the word of His power. Because we have a human nature and a divine nature existing in the same person. All the person of Christ, all that He does, both natures participate in. It's like when we type a letter, right? When you sit down and you type a letter or you write a letter, you say, I wrote the letter. You don't say, my fingers typed it. You say, I typed it. Even though your toes and your knees had nothing to do with it, right? It's the same way with Jesus. He has two natures in one person, and so whatever He does both natures are participating in because He is one person. Right? It's like the eyelid example. Our eyes are always there, but sometimes they're veiled by our eyelids. And Christ's divine nature is always there, but on earth it was veiled in flesh. This is the basis for us to see that, that Christ was weak and yet the Almighty. That He was limited and yet He was infinite. So we say that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And what John wants us to get is that the Word, the Creator God, became a man. That He took on flesh, and John wants us to behold His glory. And he says, and we, the apostles, beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, the glory of Jesus is the glory that He shares with the Father. Jesus prays in John 17, and asked the Father to glorify Him with the same glory He shared with God in eternity past. Jesus says that those who glorify Him glorify the Father. That He came that they might know God and see the glory of God. And so the coming of Jesus into the world, the glory that was beheld by the apostles, is the glory of God. Right? It's like the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the radiance of His glory. Jesus told Thomas, when you see me, you have seen the Father. The fact that Jesus has come into the world, that God has taken on human flesh, it teaches us many things about God. And this is number one in your bulletin. It teaches us that God is not distant from us. That God is not distant from us. Because if Jesus came to 
show us the glory of God, if He is the radiance of the glory of God, and He came to declare who God is to us, then that means that God is not some deity way off in the distance somewhere that wound up the universe and just let it go. But that we have a God who created us and desires to be with us. He desires to share who He is with us and He wants us to know Him. If God was some distant deity or some impersonal force, He could not have revealed Himself to us. Nor could He have come down in the person of Christ. But He did. And that means we can know God and that He wants to be known by us. God is not playing a cat and mouse game with us where He's hiding from us and making it difficult for us to find Him. God has clearly revealed Himself in creation and He has clearly revealed Himself through the person of Jesus Christ, His own Son, who, the Bible says, was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. If you want to know God and you want to know who God is, then look at Jesus. He has come and declared to us who God is and showed us the glory of God. And He is not far from us. But He has created us. He has created you. And He has put you in this time to live, in this place that you live, in order that you might seek Him. So look unto Jesus and seek God. Come to the Son and you will find the Father. Now John here also claims that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Now we are sons, right? We just saw this in verse 12 last week. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become what? The sons of God. But there's a distinction between our sonship and the sonship of Jesus. This is why John 3.16 is important when it says, that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He's not just God's only Son, because I'm a Son of God. He's the only begotten Son. And so John here says, we have seen the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Christ, the Son of God, means that He is of the same nature as God. What's wonderful about this is that God gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. And that's not something that the Father just did on a whim. This was a plan that He had from the beginning. And this is number two. God has an eternal plan and has provided a way for us to be saved. The fact that God became a man, that Jesus took on flesh, means God has a plan. It means that God has made a way for us to be saved. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. He says He did this before the foundation of the world, which means God's plan was before Adam sinned. Verse 5, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. It was a plan that God made from the foundation of the world. Revelation says Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so the truth is, is that when God created the universe, He did so to make His Son the Redeemer of His people and to be King and Lord. God didn't come up with this plan after Adam sinned And now God's left scratching his head saying, what am I going to do? This was the plan. This is an amazing truth. And this demonstrates that God is not only near to us and that God has an eternal plan, but it proves that God loves us. And that's number three. The fact that Jesus came in the flesh means God demonstrated that he loves us and that he rescues sinners. God didn't leave us to our own devices to try to save ourselves. All man does in his own works is is push himself further from God. Right? Even a fallen man's pursuit of religion is the worship of idols and of self. But man actually is moving further from God on his own. The only way for man to be saved was for God to intervene and do something. And that was God's plan. That his son would come and intervene. And that plan was made in love to send Christ to die for sinners and to send His own Spirit to work on the hearts of men to receive that salvation. You see, it's not just that Jesus did half the work. Jesus died on the cross 
and He did half the work to save us, and now we're left to figure it out the rest of the way. Jesus has accomplished everything that we need. And the Spirit of God comes along and applies those things to our hearts. In the new birth, we are made new creations. You see the wonderful love of God for us sinners, that He would send His Son to die on behalf of those who hate Him. The Bible says, perhaps for a righteous man would someone die. But we're not righteous. We're filthy sinners, rebels against the goodness of God. And yet, He has sent His Son to die for us and gives us new life. He reaches down and plucks us up and makes us His own. The wonderful choice of Jehovah to redeem us. Who would have thought that God would love a sinner even like me? That I would not only be forgiven, but united to Christ. God has given His Son not just to die on our behalf and to rise from the dead. That's where we typically stop. The Gospel doesn't stop there. The Gospel doesn't stop at the resurrection. Jesus is our substitute. That's true. He's made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Right? The substitutionary atonement. Jesus died on our, on our behalf. Won us forgiveness. But you know what the Bible says? Psalm 24. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. There are two things required to stand in the hill of the Lord. A pure heart and active righteousness. We not only need to be forgiven of our sin, but we actually have to be righteous in order to go into God's presence. We have neither thing. So Christ dies on our behalf to forgive us of our sins, but He also lived on our behalf to give us His righteousness so that we are welcomed into the presence of God. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. What a glorious truth that, the, that God the Son sunk down to the deepest dishonor that He might raise me up to the highest glory. That He sunk down into our fallen humanity that He may raise me up and unite me to God. Making me one with Himself. Taking me to be His bride. That whatever is His is mine. Taking away my reproach before God and placing His perfect robe on my shoulders. Putting His signet ring on my hand. That I have been elevated to the place of a son of God. This is the glorious doctrine of the Incarnation. That God the Son became a man. And in so doing, He has made man God's Son. And He has redeemed us. We should look at the wounds on our Savior's hands and side and see the crown of thorns on His head that He bore for those of us that that are sinners. He carried your sin up the mountain and He shed His precious blood that you might be made whole. He carried the curse of death and sin that you might be united to His righteousness and be free. That you might be given eternal life in place of eternal death. Jesus the Christ, the mighty sinless Savior, if you set your eyes on Him, you'll be saved. Behold the majesty of Christ and find all of the pleasure and satisfaction of your soul that it needs if you look to Christ. But it says not only that, but the end of verse 14, that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Two things that fallen man are in desperate need of. Now, the the Old Testament, there was still grace and truth. We're going to talk more about that in a couple weeks. But they were shadows and types. The Old Testament is essentially a picture book showing us who Jesus is and, and the way of salvation. But when Christ comes, those things come in fullness. He is the full revelation of grace and truth. And it's in His grace that He still ministers to you now. Jesus ministers for us as our great high priest, sitting before the Father, Father, pleading as our advocate. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel would sin and God would be angry with them and He would seek to destroy them. And the Bible says that Moses would go in before God and plead on their behalf and turn away the wrath of God. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what a mediator is. Jesus, in the presence of the Father, pleading on our behalf, every sin, Jesus turns to the Father and says, I have covered it. Every failure, Jesus turns to the Father and says, they have my righteousness. In Christ, the wrath of God is satisfied. But understand this, 
as our priest, Jesus is not frustrated with our failures and our mistakes. He has endured temptation in every point that we have, and He endured it all the way through. And so He knows and He understands. And so number four, Jesus understands our weakness and has compassion toward us. He's full of grace. Grace and kindness and love. Christian, when you sin, do not think that Jesus is angry with you. Listen to what the prophet Micah says in chapter 7 of Micah 7. Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity and passes my transgression of and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And He did that on the cross. He has compassion on us. He delights in mercy towards us in Christ. Jesus took the punishment for our sin in our place. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down one's life for His friends. And this is what Jesus has done for us. And so we shouldn't hesitate to run to Him in our temptations and in our failures and our sin. But this doesn't mean that Jesus is ignorant of the reality of sin. Like He's turning a blind eye to it. Because He's not only full of grace, He's full of truth. He paid for sin with His own blood. Jesus speaks only the truth. His Word is only truth. He speaks the truth in love to us. Not to harm us, but to help us. Not to tear us down, but to build us up. Jesus is full of both grace and truth. You see, if we speak truth to people without grace, that's harsh. And if we're gracious to people, but we do not care for the truth, then we're not helping them. Jesus is full of both grace and truth. Compassion toward us and truth to help us. A loving rebuke is better than flattery that lies. And so, we should love the Word of God and we should run to Jesus in prayer because He's there with grace and He's here to tell us the truth. More than that, Jesus says that He is the truth not only because He does not lie and because He always tells us the things we need to know, but He's also the truth because He's the only way to the Father. In John 14, 6, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. And so Jesus came into the world not only to reveal the Father to us, but to make a way to the Father. And so number five, Jesus reveals the truth about God to us. He tells us the truth about God. He makes a way for us in that truth to God. So come to the Son so you can come to the Father. And Jesus said, if you reject the Son, then you reject the Father. Because He has told you who the Father is. So we need to believe that Jesus came in the flesh. That He is fully God and fully man at the same time. Without mixture or division in the same person forever. We can know that God is near to us. That He loves us. That He has a plan to save us because He sent Jesus. We see that Jesus is not only our Redeemer, but He is our Advocate. Pleading on our behalf. He is full of grace and truth. And the only way to know God and to have eternal life is to trust Him. These truths should cause you to love God more. To want to worship Him for His great love that He's shown to you. To praise His Son for His salvation. It should move us to holiness. To hate sin that crucified the one we love. To fight the sin that Jesus endured. These truths should also cause us to look to Jesus for hope and peace and righteousness. Because we can't save ourselves. Right? You will not find peace or hope in your own soul only through faith in Christ, being united to Him in salvation. Only through faith in His atoning work on the cross can we have righteousness. Only through the shed blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we praise You, Lord, for You are the lovers of our souls. Jesus, You are the One who loves us and saves us to the uttermost. I pray, Father, that You would melt our hearts as we think on Your, your birth and Your agony and Your suffering and Your resurrection and Your intercession for us. Let us be bold to defy the enemy, to defeat temptation, to renounce the world, to be valiant in the truth. Deepen in us a sense of, of a holy relationship that we have with You. 
Remind us that we are your spiritual bride, the friend of Jehovah. As we think of your glory, show us our vileness. As we see your majesty, show us our lowliness. As we see your beauty, show us our deformity. In your purity, show us our filth. When we behold your righteousness, show us our iniquity. You have loved us with an everlasting, unchanging love. Help us to love you more. You have given yourself for us. You died for us. Help us to live for you. That every thought of our mind, every desire of our heart would be for you. Help us, Lord, to not dally with the world and its attractions, but walk by your side, to listen to your voice, to be clothed in your grace, and to be adorned in your righteousness. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.